friends, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the ORF, it is my honor and privilege to welcome you all this evening. We are here, of course, to celebrate the launch of my colleague, um, Gautam Chikramani's book, 70 Policies That Shaped India, 1947 to 2017, Independence to $2.5 trillion. It is indeed a very compelling chronicle of the life of India since its independence. Let me congratulate Gautam for the publication that is both comprehensive and pithy. Writing at its very best is about communicating complex ideas in an accessible and comprehensible format. I believe that Gautam might have actually achieved this remarkably well with this particular publication. He has managed to distill some of India's most contentious economic debates into a manuscript that can serve the needs of literally everyone, from government to industry to academia, and even those who are disinterested in politics. I would like to remind that the audience that Gotham's masterful work is only the latest addition to his long and illustrious career, building on his multiple personas as a journalist, editor, an economic pundit, and an author engaging with mythology and ethics. Gotham, with this, has established himself as a formidable scholar. His description of each of the 70 reforms in just 350 words deserves applause, not only for the prose, but also for the diligent research reflected in the 683 citations that decorate its pages. Indeed, the book lets the reader decide if they are happy with just a peek or they would like to dive headfirst into the debates that have shaped India's political economy. Only an individual with clarity of thought could have made this possible. Having said that, I cannot fail to point out that Gotham's true love continues to remain the complexities and subtleties of India's greatest epic, the Mahabharata. And I hope the public policy Mahabharata will give him enough room to engage on this subject as well. Gotham's book provided me with some unique perspectives, three of which I would like to share by way of introducing the book. The first, it is a very uh, apt chronicle of the evolution of India's left of center economic policy making. It reveals to us that while the 90s and 2000s certainly saw a break from the orthodox central planning that bottlenecked our economy for the latter half of the 20th century, India's full embrace of the market remains hostage to the firm grip of our socialist ethos even today. Perhaps this is a reflection of who we are, and perhaps it is an Indian consensus. Second, the book truly gives meaning to the words, past is prologue. By gleaning insights from the errors of the past, it provides a clear guide for future generation of policymakers, entrepreneurs, business leaders, and scholars to learn from. The book now serves as a permanent reminder that the unintended consequences of populist policy making can and will implicate India's full potential as an economic power. A number of policies in this book remind us of this. And finally, it would be amiss to believe that the book serves merely as a collection of our economic history, a compilation of our economic history. By exploring these 70 policies, whether it is the nationalization of banks or the recently introduced GST, the reader gets a clear sense of the author's opinion on the evolution of India's political climate. Indeed, this book is as political as it is economic. And all the readers will probably be better served because of this. The political evolution is remarkably discernible through its pages. Both Gautam and I hope that many of the, uh, uh, the conversations that this book has captured will continue to breed constructive introspection and help catalyze new ideas and will probably make a significant impact to policy making. One big impact I witnessed this evening uh, in, in real time. For the first time, Monica told me I'm his wife. So the Gotham's book has at least created this policy impact on the domestic front. Uh, Gotham's writing on the Jandhan Yojana and the Aadhaar Initiative, for example, are relevant to our work of financial inclusion at ORF and across the research community. And this is perhaps one of the ideas and one of the, uh, the, the chapters that Gotham has captured can contribute to the current debate. And his work on contemporary reforms such as the in Insolvency and Bankruptcy Code and the GST will certainly continue to linger in public debates as these uh, policies are fine-tuned, revised, reformed, and made more efficient. I am certain that scholars, research organizations, and members of our government will similarly find that this book adds great value to their own efforts. Ultimately, the book reminds us, and I am paraphrasing Sanjeev Sanyal, that while history does not repeat itself, it does rhyme. It does rhyme. 
It does, uh, don't ask me what it means, but I like the sentence. <laughs> India's once protagonist and isolationist stance is gradually giving way to a nation that is beginning to embrace the full potential of its economic growth, and yet the shadows of our past create hesitancy in our progress. It is my hope that everyone gathered here today will find learning from it as enjoyable as I have. Uh, with this, let me first request uh, Sri Rajiv Kumarji and the panel uh, to release the book, to launch the book. I think you have a copy in front of you. And can we launch this, please? I have a copy, too. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Samir, and good evening, everybody. Uh, uh, I will uh, take you on your word and just actually say a few words. Uh, and f first and foremost, many congratulations, Gautam. I think you've, uh, have, I've had the chance to uh, glance through this uh, book. Uh, I've sent an advance copy, and I think it is, it's, it's remarkable. I think only uh, somebody with as uh, stellar a career as a journalist as you could have done what you've done here, which is, uh, you know, because I, these, are, these are sketches, these are sort of pen outlines uh, these are sort of uh, abstracts, uh, which really, um, you know, which, which really, in some sense, cover the entire canvas of uh, economic policy making in this country. Look at its, you know, changes. Look at its ups and downs, and and therefore, and but, um, and, and doing it so pithily, you know, and doing it so pithily, so that it really is uh, something that I will, I, I think, will adorn everybody's shelf who wants to you know, lo learn about, you know, like a reference book, actually, almost. You know, you want to learn about the DGTD, it's there, but demonetization is there, telecom, regulatory authority. So you could, there is, there is virtually no topic or no policy decision that's left uncovered. Uh, and until, and you really brought it very up to date. So, so many congratulations, uh, you know, for, 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 for doing this, uh, for, you know, for giving to us, uh, you know, what, you, what you've done here. Um, uh, let me admit to the fact that uh, you, in some sense, beaten me to it, because for about a year I've been working on uh, tell ten changes that have marked Indian history, Indian economic history, and that is a book that you know I've signed a contract already, but uh, I've not been able to do it. Also, because I'm looking at it much more as an economic historian rather than as a journalist, and I think that's. But nonetheless, um, um, that, that's uh, and this this is where I think I want to bring in as to what the difference uh, in my approach to yours would be. Uh, I, and, and I hope you won't mind saying this, uh, but uh, to draw out my approach, that's the way I put it, but to, to my approach uh, is, because I'm still working on it, is to go into some detail into everything and as much as possible. Because I thought that to draw out the policy lessons from it, as you know, some, Whichever, you know, whatever be the big events, I think you needed to get into the sort of real depths and nuances and the personalities uh, to be able to, because each, each policy decision is very contingent upon the circumstances in which it's taken, uh, is, is, is shaped, that is the view I've taken, by the personalities who have been involved, by the interplay of the personalities that have been involved, by, the, you know, by all the stakeholders, etc. And uh, to that extent, I will use your book now. Uh, to actually use, uh, you know, to get to those uh, 10 and then get into the depth of it. I'm saying this simply to say that, yes, uh, you know, the uh, reading it whets your appetite for much more. That's the way I would let me, let me put it like that. So each chapter of yours, you know, tells me, uh, you know, that there is a whole story hidden behind it. And, you know, if you wanted to go into it, then you would go. I, I don't particularly want, in, you know, want to, uh, uh, you know, go into the, um, you know, you've covered everything, for example, nationalization of banks. Now, the pros and cons of that particular action are now with us, you know, and, and will probably, uh, you know, continue, I don't know for how long, or whether it's coal mines or it is the, you know, uh, I'm not, um, and, 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 or central planning and, you know, whatever. Uh, those decisions uh, have affected, impacted each one of us. But whether they were right or wrong, I think is a judgment that I would suspend. And I think it's the audience, as they read it, will you know, find for themselves. Um, let, me just, uh, uh, let me just sort of say here that um, uh, from the Niti Ayog perspective, the role of, uh, the role of uh, intellectual, or if you like, research or think tank 
in the government policy making has evolved you know, so much in these sort of five, six decades that we've got. I think uh, maybe one chapter on that would have been a very useful one as to how we start, you know, how we, how we view policy making uh, in, in government. How, it, how, how, how is policy making done in the government? Because you've seen all of this happening, you've seen it. And then maybe a summary of that uh, would have been very useful, uh, for me at least, as far as I can, as I said, from the Niti Aayog's point of view. The only, uh, um, uh, the only one argument I have with you is about demonetization, uh, because I have been a very ardent supporter of it. I first suggested that in the National Security Advisory Board in 2008, uh, that that was the only way to and get hold of the, you know, get hold of the sort of ill-gotten wealth and, and, and really sort of push back the culture where nothing mattered as to how you got, to, how you achieved whatever wealth you did, but you could strut around uh, in the society having got that. And, and for me, the, you know, it was much more the fact of, uh, you know, draining the swamp rather than trying, you know, sort of, you know, using only flows uh, to clean it up. And therefore, as I said, I have, uh, I, I have been, and I admit, uh, you know, and I, I no, no hesitation in admitting that I think it was one of the bravest efforts, uh, you know, uh, moves that, uh, this government has made. Yes, we messed up on it, you know, and I think there was, uh, and it became, uh, you know, to a certain extent, but also in the sense that the circumstances, uh, you know, converted that into a, if you like, uh, you know, uh, if you like, uh, uh, how do you say, uh, uh, not demonetization, but a money supply exchange, if you like, you know, that's what has happened. Uh, that, but in the, in the, you know, because everybody effectively uh, will receive, was able to, you know, in some sense, uh, you know, uh, convert his or her money into gray and not white, but that's, but at least into gray, and that's the that's the achievement that we've got because these are there are now all these monies which are now into accounts which are under the, you know, purview and in the, in the focus of the tax authorities, and they are in the banking system, and so therefore it's not, uh, you know, they're not sloshing around there. Now again to say that, look, uh, you, that doesn't mean that you can stop generation of black money, you haven't been able to stop uh, generation of all the parallel, you know, cash, etc. But that's, that, that's, that, that, that's, that was not the, that was not the uh, claim either, because uh, to stop the flow going forward requires a lot more you know, a lot more in terms of regulatory changes, in terms of the way you handle, uh, you know, tax, the way you handle, you know, all, all of that stuff. Uh, but at least the stock of particular, uh, until one point, uh, converted itself from pure black into gray, which is therefore now led to a huge expansion in the, in the tax base, uh, both on the, uh, you know, on the direct side and the indirect side, and also to a, to a, to a, to a pushback to a culture which said that you know you could just accumulate wealth whichever way you want, whichever way you want, and nobody would there be there to question you. And I think that's got that that has an impact already. You can see that in the economy, you see that in the business activity, and you see it in several sectors, uh, you know, uh, around us as we go. So to have to 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 try and produce a cleaner economy, uh, you you needed that step because without that, I don't think. Uh, you could have, you could have, you, you know, you could start that process. Uh, last, last bit. I have done my defil on uh, coal nationalisation, uh, on coal industry, and I, one of my first two chapters were on why the nationalisation took place. Uh, I had said in my article that was published in EPW, a two-part article, that this was neither socialist nor planned nor desired. You know, and I think, uh, you know, I thought I missed the fact that the Tatas who own the Jamadoba collieries and their cooking coal collieries, their tiff with Chenna Reddy at that point of time, and which is what led in some sense to the nationalization of the cooking coal mines then to be followed by the non-cooking coal mines and the kind of disaster that we had on our hands with the non-cooking mines, then you know, the labor employed almost, uh, you know, almost doubling you know, in the process between 1971 to 73. That particular saga, if you had covered somehow, uh, would have been very much of a, uh, you know, would have revealed a lot into how the decisions sometimes are taken in this country, which should not be taken the way they are. And, 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 and you know, and, and how, therefore, in policy making, the objective of serving the national interest, uh, how it should, you know, how it could be 
uh, how it is very often, uh, you know, in some sense, uh, totally, um, you know, um, uh, forgotten, if you like, and other objectives and other considerations take precedence. But once more, uh, thank you for evoking all these thoughts. I commend this book tremendously to everybody because once you read it, each chapter is a nugget which will take you, which will rock your memory, which will take you back several decades, which very often, but will also, you know, in, will also, prove, you know, sort of uh, lead you to connect there to what is happening today. And I think that's where the uh, big contribution is. Once more, congratulations. Thanks. Actually, what this clearly demonstrates is that he has been already excited by the, some of the nuggets you've mentioned in the book, both on round the coal. Like Correct. Like so the EPW paper, uh, the six, one of the 683 citations is of that paper. But now he wants a book around that. So that's your second book going ahead. Let me um, <laughs> now invite Gautam himself to, uh, to say a few words on the process on the book, which he promised to give to me in seven weeks, but took seven months. But go ahead. <laughs> Good evening. Uh, I see a lot of friends. I see some policy makers, some policy analysts. Uh, I'm delighted to see young people um, more than old. Uh, I see people whose work I have cited. I see people whose work I may be citing in the future. Thank you for coming. Without uh, Without overusing the word, what I can say is that the process of writing this book has been transformative for me. It began with a lot of frustration, anger. Every chapter as I was finishing, it, uh, it required a whole lot of study and uh, reading uh, a lot of material. And I, by the end of it, I would be a nervous wreck in the sense that how could we design policies that hurt our own country in such a deep, it has scarred our country in such a deep manner. Uh, as I go on, I will tell you how that view has changed. For instance, uh, this is a book only about economic policies, and therefore one of the prime people to whom it affects is entrepreneurs. Speaking just within the entrepreneurial confines, for instance, you will see that how policy after policy has prevented entrepreneurship from forming in India in the early stages of our independence. You want to set up a business, the Industrial Policy Resolution of 96, 19, uh, 1956 will tell you what you can make, where you can make, to which quantity, how much, when, at what price you need to sell. You need money to, for your business. The government will decide how much you can borrow because all the banks were public sector, two acts of parliament, IFCI in 1948 and IDBI in 1964 were the formation of financial institutions. ICICI was not under an act of parliament, but yet was under government control. You want to bring foreign investment or take your money outside if you want to set up a business, the Foreign Exchange Regulation Act of 1973 raised the hurdle. Any problem you have in any part of the economy, nationalization was the answer. Air India in 1953, life insurance in 1956, banks in 1969 and 1980, coal, as he mentioned, in 1971, 1972, and 1973. The heavy hand of the government didn't just stop at law making. I think the bureaucracy then got its act together and took it to insane levels. How many of you know what a spittoon is here? Some of you don't even know what a spittoon is. Spittoon is a, is a bucket in which there is some sand kept so that the people, when they want to spit, don't spit as they do in government offices on the corners of the staircases, but into that receptacle where you go and spit. Now, in the Factories Act, it's a, it's, a good, it's a good practice in the sense you want to switch factories and all that, it, it must be nice. But does it need it to be encoded into law? Section 20 in Chapter 3 of the Factories Act tells you that you should have spittoons in every factory. It should be, it is left to the state governments for execution, but that it should have, it should be at a certain distance. 
uh, and if it is not in that certain distance from the plant, you need a certificate from the inspector that allows you to tell you why it's not in that. And we are just talking about a spittoon. So I respect the fact that perhaps they thought Indian labor, all it does is eat tobacco and spew it out. But uh, did it really need to be in law? I ask this question because I've been meeting several CEOs in modern industries today, like in pharmaceuticals. And you can't have a spittoon in a pharmaceutical plant anywhere near it. They are ex exceedingly hygienic places where they manufacture medicines or even food processing. So how do they get, a get around this spittoon business, I asked him. So he says when a junior officer comes to him, uh, they say, he says that you need to have a spittoon and you don't have that spittoon, so you are in trouble. So then they appeal to the senior officer. The senior officer apparently understands and agrees that, yeah, you don't need these spittoons near your plant, but, uh, and so you are given an exemption. But in the meantime, that junior inspector who raised the issue in, with all uh, earnestness, or perhaps corruption, I don't know, uh, feels violated and then gets annoyed, and there is a whole related junior officers in various other aspects of a factory that come and start harassing them. Minimum wages is a very good idea. Every human worker must get a minimum wage for, for the work that he puts. Uh, and therefore, the Minimum Wages Act of 1948 was formed. Can anybody tell me how many minimum, not, not those who have read the books, no, no cheating, please. Can, but those who haven't read the book, can you guess how many minimum wages are there in our country today? Let me give you a hint. Although the law is a central law, it is executed at the state, so 29 states, how many minimum wages should be there? There are 1,200 minimum wages in our country today. 1,200. I don't know what makes, so when I got deeper into those, the structure of those minimum wages, they are of skilled, unskilled, dangerous, all kinds of workers, but the idea is if it's a minimum wage, Nobody is telling you to uh, uh, give a maximum wage. It's a minimum wage. And now we have 1,200. How far can bureaucracy twist, turn, is simply visible from this, just this small statistic. So from minimum wages to labor, for labor, let me move to maximum retail prices for consumers. There's a person called B. Subhashan Reddy, who would have gone to jail for two years apart from fines. And you know his crime? His crime was that under the Standards of Weights and Measures Act of 1976, he wrote MRP instead of maximum retail price. The, in, the inspector took him to court, he fought, and he would have been in jail for two years until Andhra Pradesh High Court corrected this and said, MRP is allowed, and now MRP is a common vocabulary. But had it not been for this threat of jail for Mr. Reddy, we would have still been seeing maximum retail price. I think this kind of uh, coercion, this kind of coming down our Indian entrepreneurs resulted in a lot of economic nudges here and there that did not bring the efficiency that the Indian economy needed. When the balance of payments crisis came in 1991, India was forced to change. And to the credit of, the, of politics, the same political dispensation that had made all these laws changed and opened the economy. Unfortunately, I think while the license Raj has been reduced, the inspector Raj continues. And change has become difficult to execute because rent-seeking has now become part of the bureaucratic DNA. The goods and services tax of 2017, for instance, which in my opinion is the most complex economic law that India has ever drafted. And the complexity comes from the fact that there is one constitutional amendment, four acts of parliament, and 29 state acts, apart from seven notifications, that have come together as a, as a superstructure which is holding up an, an idea called GST, which has translated 17 taxes into one. In, that, in this, under GST, everything is supposed to be digital. 
from invoicing to payments to tax paying to refunds, etc. I was in Pondicherry for the Pondicherry Literature Fest uh, two days ago, and I met some entrepreneurs there who were telling me that this is changing. The new laws, the new notifications that have come in order to get your export credit back, refund, is requires that every invoice should come on a five rupee stamp paper in a physical file, which goes from desk one to desk two to desk three to desk four at a payment of 100 rupees, 200 rupees, 500 rupees, 700 rupees, until the, 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 the cumulative value of all the payments becomes 1% of the money that the exporter is supposed to get. This corruption is coming back in Pondicherry. I don't know what about others. I see some editor friends here. I hope you will push this story, uh, explore this, and prevent this uh, shameless rent-seeking that is now coming up. This must be snipped in the bud before it becomes another mountain of bureaucratic procedures. And these things make me very angry, as I was telling you. And when I get angry, I have no recourse but to, <laughs> but to hit philosophy. And uh, in my, I have a secret life, which uh, he, uh, Samir has made public, which is that I follow some scriptures and I work on the Mahabharat in particular. And when we do scriptural analysis, we use something called hermeneutics. In the Western approach, it, you approach the Indian uh, scriptures with the hermeneutics of suspicion. You are skeptical. You think that they have said something which they did not mean, the caste system, and so on. In the Indian tradition, we look at these scriptures with respect. The rishis are supposed to be at a higher consciousness, and they have worked in a different time-space constraint. When I look back at these 70 policies with all the advantages of a 2020 vision, and I, with all the confidence to criticize them and condemn them, I sometimes feel that, you know, India is not an easy country to govern. With our democratic processes, our people, the different kinds of people and different, the language, the religions, the castes, and yet, with all this confusion and chaos, we have become the world's fifth largest economy in 70 years. I think it's a kudos to not only the political system, but the political leaderships as well. We can draw several lessons from these 70 policies, but that, like Raji uh, said, that it's a uh, uh, matter of a future book. Maybe we can collaborate. <laughs> but I, I see several scholars here. I've signed books. Uh, and they, they told me they are policy uh, followers. I think you should get into each policy, examine it. There are enough linkages at the end. There are enough references at the end. Go deep into it. Tell us. Maybe together. Maybe ORF can uh, tie up with various other think tanks and go one uh, policy after another and bring out at least 20 to 25 policies that tell the, the new government that will be formed in 2019 what exactly needs to be done. The spittoon is one idea, the minimum wages is another. As you explore, you will find 100 other ideas. I think we need to work together as a policy fraternity and bring our country back on track. I look at India as a $10 trillion economy. People laugh at me. But I think before I die, I may actually see India as a $10 trillion economy. With these words, I thank you for coming here. Samir. <clears throat> Finishing them in 45 minutes is a bit of a task, a tall order you've given me, Samir. Uh, but uh, to start this whole discussion, you know, this is uh, a great book. I enjoyed reading it for the simple reason that uh, I think Gotham is a master of pressy writing. In 350 words, he kind of uh, uh, distills the sense of every major you know, economic policy which has appeared in India in, in the last 72 years. Uh, the only thing I was wondering was why this magic number of 70? How come they weren't 75 or 80 or 65? So there must have been some poetic mystery behind it, I know, that you got down to the figure 70. Uh, but it's, it's an extremely comprehensive you know, coverage of these uh, years. And what struck me particularly were you know, uh, two things. If you go by the book, the maximum policy interventions, he's, he's divided by decades. First decade, second decade, third decade, fourth decade, fifth decade, sixth decade, seventh decade. The first decade, 
saw the highest number of policy interventions. He's got 15 chapters there. Then the number kind of dwindles and peters out and you know, we are going left, we are going right, I don't know which way, which way we are going. And then suddenly in 19, as we end up in the sixth decade, post 87, the number of policy interventions again shoots up. It becomes as much as it was in the first decade. And that pace continues right into the seventh decade. So that tells you the story of structural reforms in India, 1990. The build up to 1990 when the major economic reforms started happening, when India kind of reimagined the way it should be governed, the way its economy should be governed, there was a spurt of activity. Not that policy making was not happening, economic policy making was still happening. But there was a sudden new direction, a new drive which came into it to kind of redo the things. Uh, but all these can be discussed later. Uh, we will come back to many of these issues later. I will just jump straight into the discussions. And to begin with, I will invite Manish uh, for his comments. And I would say, and everyone says, 60 out of the 70 years belong to the Congress. So many of the interventions which we are reading about in this book happened during the Congress's time. And uh, to be fair, every policy has a context. And right from the time of 1947, some of the very interventionist state-led policies which you followed, ultimately policy making is not a purely economic process, it is a political process. There's a political economy at work which dictates what policies shall come into being. So when, when you see the transition right down from the first, the first six decades, in, uh, the first five decades into the sixth and then to the seventh, what do you make of this, Manish? Thanks, Sanjay. Uh, first of all, let me join uh, Rajiv and Sanjay in congratulating Gotham for writing a fantastic book. And uh, this is not just a platitude because the author is sitting right next to me. I actually mean what I say. He's uh, really done seminal work and uh, created a kaleidoscope of seven decades of Indian independence and uh, the policies that we pursued uh, over that span of time. I think what's, what's interesting, uh, Sanjay, is what uh, Samir said. It's a, it's a deeply political book. When uh, I read the book, it, uh, to me, it was not just a laundry list of uh, policies or laws that we had enacted over seven decades. It was an intense glimpse into the underlying politics of uh, different decades of India's uh, journey. And essentially, if I was to divide it up, I think they, in the last 70 years, you've actually seen about five phases, and those five phases are fairly distinct. So you have 47 to 64, which are the real socialist years. And then you have 64 to 1991, which are the statist years. And uh, then you have 191 to 98, when you try and implement the Washington Consensus. And then you have 98 to 2014, which is the, the, the growth and equity uh, story, uh, where you become more interventionist again. And uh, 2014 uh, to 2018, I don't want to embarrass the gentleman sitting on my right and the gentleman sitting on the extreme left, so I'll just leave it at that. So be that as it may, it's, uh, it's an extremely uh, insightful, intellectual exercise and a meandering journey down the memory lane, uh, which tells you as to how uh, politics really evolved and changed uh, over all these decades. For example, uh, Gotham talked about the Minimum Wages Act. Now for an India which had just uh, emerged out of the clutches of British imperialism, uh, to really even try and imagine that uh, we need to have a Minimum Wages Act. 
you know, was something which was completely and absolutely uh, breathtaking in its scope. It's another matter that we've ended up implementing it so stupidly that we've ended up with the number of wage rates or minimum wage rates that we have. On another uh, dimension, it's also the story of policy excesses. So therefore, for example, the nationalization of Air India. Now, there was no real need to really nationalize Air India. And if you look at the industrial policy resolution of 1956, what flashed into my mind was not 1956, but the Awadi session of the Congress in 1955, where the Congress adopts the socialistic uh, pattern of society uh, resolution, and then <coughs> Subsequently, uh, the laws and the policies sort of flesh themselves out. So it's an, it's an extremely interesting journey into, into the politics of India. And uh, to answer your question that, uh, well, six decades look like uh, one template and the seventh decade looks like another one. The fact is that in 1991, the world collapsed around you. One uh, ideology which uh, was responsible for the economic direction of half of the world suddenly disappeared overnight. And so therefore you had to readjust yourself. And so the readjustment between uh, 1991 and 1996, the creation of the Foreign Investment Promotion Board and the various other, uh, uh, other, other uh, enactments which were repealed, was, I guess, a, a consequence out of being a pawn in the larger scheme of things where you had global forces driving you. And you could either end up like a North Korea or possibly be in sync with the rest of the world, and which is what we very wisely chose, chose, chose to be. But even there, the policy excesses did not stop. For example, the Prevention of Money Laundering Act of 2002, in my humble opinion, is the most retrogressive piece of legislation which we could have put on the statute. And so, so, so therefore, uh, I think Gotham has, has, has put it very well. You know, A, it's, it's about the politics of policy, and B, it's about the excesses of policy. Thank you, Manish. That was an excellent intervention. Now, leading from that, and uh, let me just prod you a bit more, and I will also be happy if Rajiv responds to this. Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, again, I go back to the simple fact that the sixth decade saw some of the most radical policies come about. This is the decade just before the one we are in, we just finished. Interestingly, this was, these were coalition governments. So this whole argument that, you know, you need strong governments, you need strong leaders to be able to push policies. Is it really correct? Some of the most radical reforms, economic reforms which took place, actually took place under coalition governments, under so-called weak governments, which managed to build consensus for these kinds of reforms. So how much is, is there a larger logic to the policy trajectory of India? A larger logic which then no matter which party comes into power, which government comes into power, it does not have a choice but follow the inevitable logic of the transition, which we have been seeing since 1991 in the reform process. I mean, even, I even take a hypothetical example. Supposing in 1991 we had a Marxist-led government, would reforms have been any different? I mean, the fact that uh, West Bengal and China uh, had uh, different forms of government from those 27 years that you had CPM in power and you had Deng Xiaoping starting his work in China uh, should prove to you uh, that you can have very different outcomes and different governments when you have, you know, when you have uh, different political parties in power. So, I mean, I, I beg to differ very much which is that uh, if, for example, 
as was almost the case that Jyoti Babu had become uh, the Prime Minister of India at a particular point of time, I think you, should, you would have seen a situation which would have been very different uh, from what you, ha what you saw uh, you know, folding out. Even for the fact that even if uh, you didn't have uh, uh, Narsimha Rao Saab, you know, becoming the Prime Minister and there were other contenders of power at that point of time, as you know, and that he hadn't appointed the person that he did appoint as a finance minister, you know, would have, you, would have said, you would have very different policy outcomes. Now, you, know, you see, the point I'm trying to make is that there is, in at least, uh, in my view, um, given in our, in, in our country, um, there is no, I can't see any sort of, uh, any um, in, uh, unstoppable structural forces you know, which are pushing you in one direction, one direction. No, not at all. We are so heterogeneous. We are so diverse. We are so, therefore, you know, almost, uh, uh, we are so, therefore, non-cohesive uh, in our, the way we look that uh, we, every, every day almost is an existential policy choice day. You, know, you can make things, and I think the book can kind of, you know, uh, looks, you know, brings that out. That any policy, as I, and as I mentioned the case of the coal nationalization, very often egos of persons, you know, and, and uh, egos of persons and really, you know, just sort of, uh, how do you say, likes and dislikes have determined policies almost, you know, and, and their implementation, which is even more important. I mean, DGTD, for example, could have been a good idea, but the way I know it was implemented, and I know many stories there because I'd done some work on it, was, was disastrous, not because, of anything, not because of the way the policy was formulated, but by the way it was implemented by the bureaucracy in charge. So, um, Sanjay, honestly, um, Indian policy making is a lot about individuals and their objective functions, which have often not aligned themselves with the national objective function. Uh, would you agree, Manish, would you agree that India is a great country which we do not speak of a trajectory of growth, but it is more subject to the ebbs and flows and the whims of individuals? Is, is, is that true? So let me answer this question in the following manner. For example, suppose in 1991, Mr. Jyoti Basu would have become Prime Minister of India. 91. Would... Uh, the whole process of liberalization and integrating with the global economy have unfolded in the manner in which it did? The answer is no. The, you know, Mr. Jyoti Basu, even though he had tremendous amount of administrative experience, he would have led the state of West Bengal for over uh, two decades by that point in time, you know, was ideologically dogmatic. But, if Mr. Jyoti Basu would have become Prime Minister after the fall of the Deva Gauda government, when it was offered to him and the CPM declined for different reasons, would he have been able to halt the trajectory of the reform process? The answer is again no. You see, at times, uh, when you set things in motion, they acquire a momentum of their own that even the most ideologically dogmatic uh, pratik is not able to reverse the process. So it really depends uh, as to what the inflection point is. For example, if instead of Mr. Narsim Rao, suppose Dr. Shankar Dayal Sharma would have become president, uh, prime minister, uh, well, uh, conventional uh, wisdom has it that it was ostensibly offered to him. Or for that matter, if Mr. Sharad Pawar or Mr. Arjun Singh would have become Prime Minister, would the trajectory of uh, the economic liberalization process have been any different? The answer is no. Because uh, there was an invisible force, and that invisible force was the power of global events which was driving you in a manner whereby I don't think India had 
really very many choices till the time you know you were not so ideologically hide bound that you would you you were prepared to completely ignore uh, what was the march of history at that point in time ashok uh, sorry i uh, just said that i i tend to at least completely disagree on this because the you know because i think there have been let me just put it like that that the the freedom the degree of the freedom of degree of freedom for cho policy choice making has been enormous in this country because for of no other reason that the accountability of those who are governing uh, you know to the people who who have represented them has been at very often very very weak and has never been there a performance sort of based outcome as it were so uh, uh, and i i can get into very many details from real experience uh, you know to to back up my argument so good we are having a discussion over here so that that is all that a book should be about a good discussion ashok let me come to you now and i'll continue this train of thought uh, you know samir also spoke about it when he was introducing the book and uh, he was talking about the years of socialism and socialist thinking which was very much part of the indian ethos has it really died out i would still say that most of our policies i mean india the most right 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 wing of center uh, there's no right right of center everyone is left of center when you start talking of any policy that you talk, start talking about reforms you start talking about banking reforms you start you know talking about even about unleashing the animal spirits and getting entrepreneurship loose you are still basically at the core a deeply populist leftist economy you will remain socialist what is your take on it uh, well let me uh, begin by clarifying something uh, which manish uh, alluded to uh, i do work for the president's office as some of you know uh, i am conscious of my position i am not going to take a political position here i have my own political views which will which will remain private while i am in this office so i'm not here to argue for or against i will offer very careful 12th man views i can't bat i can't uh, uh, bowl but i can field uh, and which is all i'm going to do today uh, first of all let me congratulate gautam on this book uh, because uh, Uh, when i do finish working in government and go back to writing columns uh, this is excellent material for me to write columns you've done all my work for me thank you so much <laughs> this is an excellent book this is a very meticulously put together list of executive decisions and pol and policies and laws that have shaped indian uh, economic uh, policy making and thinking and i think there are several follow up books which i'm sure you are already thinking of and should do uh <clears throat> coming to the question which uh, Uh, sanjay has put to me i think uh, the two three points here one uh, if you broadly divide indian uh, economic policy making to uh, the period between 47 and say 64 or 66 perhaps uh, then there's the 20 year period between roughly the mid 60s and the early 80s and then rajiv gandhi onwards we begin to gradually open up and of course post 91 this is part i think uh if i could be permitted this word the most toxic period perhaps was the one in the middle it's also uh the one the legacy of which is still with us not just in terms of economic thinking not just in terms of politics but in terms of uh social thinking uh you can't have economically right wing uh or, or right wing economics in the absence of larger social and intellectual space that values or prioritizes such thinking or such such openness and frankly as a society we have some way to go the legacy of that mid 60s and 70s is still with us is still with us as a society is still with us as a polity is still with us as a system and uh, despite the changes that have happened since 91 under successive governments i think there's still a long way to go before we get rid of it uh the second issue and uh, this will somewhat contradict the first i think many of us in rooms like this in 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 sections of the media in in while well, writing books like this in think tanks uh tend to define reforms perhaps correctly so as as we see them and as in, as progressive or good policy that we think is needed for the country and i have no argument with much of this thinking 
uh, I think we also need to put ourselves in the shoes of the politician. I'm not saying the politician is always right. We may well be often wrong. But we have to put ourselves in his shoes. Does he think the way, or does she think the way we think? Uh, does the constituency he prioritizes or feels is more important, and not just because of votes or something, also in terms of his or her conceptualization of the country, or his, his or her conceptualization of what is the greater common good? Uh, how does that person actually think? How does the politician think? Uh, he may be right, he may be wrong, I'm not going into that. But the fact is he thinks differently. Merely disagreeing with him, and this could be any party, Congress, BJP, you know, CPM, Janata Dal, whatever. Merely disagreeing with him and saying you must think the way I do, rather than trying to figure out why does he think the way he does. Creates not a conversation, but uh, two di completely divergent uh, streams. I'll give you one example. I don't think there's anyone in this room who would argue for the continued nationalization of Air India. I don't think there's anyone in any mainstream political party who in privately or even publicly, as Manish has said, uh, will argue for Air India being a, a public sector company forever. But successive ministers in both Congress governments and BJP governments have actually got exasperated by what they call the Air India test by some of us seeking to measure a government's commitment to reform or sensible policy making solely by the fact that have you privatized Air India or not. Now, please understand, I'm not trying to say Air India should not be privatized. It should be. But we sometimes tend to put that as the sole test and the sole arbiter. The politician doesn't always think like that. So I don't quite know if I've answered your question or, or typically uh, sort of uh, uh, weaseled my way out of a difficult situation, but that is what I have to say. Well, knowing where you are, yes, you've been very correct. <laughs> uh, Shamika, let me come to you. I mean, you, uh, and back, and I'll come back to this question about uh, this whole thing of, uh, that we are ultimately left of center because the heart is left and the heart is always left. And there are necessities that the political economy dictates certain uh, uh, compulsions that push uh, the economy in a particular direction, certain policies in certain directions. That is one part of it. But the question I want to ask you is something different. You have been working a lot on health, you've been working a lot on education, you've been working a lot on financial inclusion. This is about 70 years of policy making which has happened. Now looking at the future, do we continue with the same uh, no, today there are possibilities of having good evidence-based policy making uh, through big data analytics and those kinds of streams. Now, do you see our country also evolving into a format where policy making can get more informed? We start using big data analytics to not just, you know, post-mortem policies 50 years later, but conduct an actual evaluation of them in real time, not throw them out, but tweak them transform them, change them, nudge them in the right direction so that they start delivering what they are really meant to deliver. Uh, do you think that is possible? So, um, let me do the honors and, you know, there are lots of civil service aspirants and they obviously love the book because, because it's the go-to place. So, it is going to do well, even commercially, if ORF actually does plan to have a revenue model around it. So, congratulations. It's an excellent compilation. I really did enjoy reading it. Uh, largely also because, because for s people like us who, who have started analyzing uh, the modern Indian economy, uh, we generally abstract away from the history and uh, we're looking at, uh, you know, mostly positive and normative economics from today's data sets, you know, from today's stand uh, point and vantage point. So this was a very interesting uh, uh, sort of compilation. It gave me a sense of the timeline and a sort of deeper perspective on, on, on the extent of the problem. <laughs> I do think uh, that, going back to your question, Sanjay, and mostly alluding also to the past discussion we have had, I'm a big believer in political entrepreneurship. I do think that India, whenever we have had inflection points in the economy, whether at the national level or at the state level, it has been driven by individuals. Individuals, political leaders carry a great deal of weight, their vision, whether they're able to translate it. Uh, I think you know, several of them have, have demonstrated and we have state level example as well as uh, all India level examples. So they do have that degrees of freedom. I think the big struggle, however, 
is in terms of the government capacity. So this is not the political leadership. This is, to, you know, I'm talking about the executive uh, uh, body, which is the government capacity at the end of the day. That if you have popular uh, uh, buy-in for big bang reforms, and Air India does definitely stand as one of them, you know, there is a big gap between the intent of the political leaders and the executive class, which I'm sorry is resistant to change in this country, like, 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 like you know, one of those uh, uh, immovable objects where ideas, you know, find their way in, but it's not institutionalized yet. You know, so if you look at the history of, of evolution of Indian economy, you have had to bring in, you know, new people, new mindset, and that's when change has happened. Uh, I think, uh, you know, going back to your specific question on artificial intelligence, big data analytics, Sandhya, they're very useful if you can get the bureaucracy to, to act, you know, to put their focus uh, solely on performance. And I think this is something Niti has been trying for some time now to, to link, uh, you know, uh, devolution or to link payments, to link uh, uh, budgets to performance. Uh, because we have been very good at allocating resources for programs and schemes that we believe are important or that, you know, politically has a great buy-in. But we have had very few checks and balances within the government system to basically improve it or, or, or alter it uh, based on the performance, other than elections. So in five years, you have, you have people going to, to, to polls and, and voting out certain uh, uh, big agendas, but, but that's not what, you know, economic reforms are, while there might be few that are big bang, most of them are day-to-day, -day, uh, you know, issues. It's the plumbing of, of, you know, the economy, which is the non-sexy part of it, which is the job uh, of, I think, the bureaucracy. And I think there we have had almost no inward lens. So big data analytics, artificial intelligence, I think, provide an objective way through, of course, the, you know, the lens of, uh, you know, intelligent uh, people uh, like Rajiv and others in the system who, who can use these tools to improve performances uh, within the government. So I'm a big believer in this. I think there's a great deal of work already happening in health, particularly. Uh, you know, there is an effort to now uh, understand or rate hospitals, you know, district hospitals. We're trying to understand that so much resources are going in, but what exactly is the performance? And, and you know, democratizing a lot of these uh, decisions by giving people information on performances at this unit levels. So I think all of that becomes possible only because now we have Digital India, we have a great deal of uh, uh, real-time data available with the, with the administration. So, so this kind of tinkering is, I think, very, very important and has to become the, the mainstay within governments. Uh, Gautam, before I open this up for the House, uh, I would like to give you a chance to respond to any of the issues which you think the panelists have raised and you would like to comment on. No, I think all of them are relevant and while each of them can go deeper, uh, they are all very relevant, very insightful and I think every individual who reads this book will come with his own conclusions uh, through various windows, the, 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 the policy that he sees through the window that he comes in from will determine what he sees of that uh, or gets from the book. I would rather look ahead and I think uh, you, you asked a question about the future policies, big data, etc. I think there are three things we need to look at uh, when we make policies henceforth and these are just uh, quick thoughts, I, they need a deeper uh, discussion. First is I think every policy must have a sell by date. The policy of 1950s may not be applicable in the 2000s today. Uh, I'm sorry to bring this up again, but I think Spittoon is a very a good example. So any time that uh, a, a policy you feel is lagging the reality, r lagging the outcomes, lagging the ability for it to bring the change that it had been planned to and crafted for, is a time to revisit that policy. I would give it three years, somebody can give it five, but the sell-by date of every economic policy is now a must for a 21st century policy making. <clears throat> Second, I think a lot of policy intent is getting lost in, at the hands of policy execution. So I think administrative reforms for the bureaucracy, uh, we need, the report after report has come and gone, 
but we have not moved forward. So the only thing that happens in pay, pay commissions is an increase in pay and we are not uh, we are not saying that you should not pay our civil servants well. Must we must pay them well. But the administrative reforms, which is the second part of the story, are not moving even an inch. I think we as a policy fraternity need to push these administrative reforms, need to push what the changes that we require, bring more accountability into every individual. Today, we constantly, I mean, I don't need, even need to say this, but everybody must know somebody, some tax person who laid a penalty and got transferred and he moved on with life and it was a false penalty, partly because of corruption, partly for uh, not understanding or whatever. And the person who is at the other end of that policy is aggrieved, remains aggrieved. There should be some way in the same big data, AI, the same technologies that you talk about to create policy can be used to deliver greater outcomes from existing, from on the ex execution side uh, through account for accountability. Uh, the third thing I think we need to look more seriously at the revolving door uh, uh, because then the private person who can come into the government for three years brings knowledge, brings perspective that is an on-ground reality. Otherwise, sitting in an air-conditioned office, uh, you can devise any policy, copy-paste a few. Uh, today, the, the fashion statement is you pick up what the world is doing, tweak it here and there, and you have a policy ready. I don't think we need to do that. I think we need to get serious about this revolving door business. I think those eight joint secretaries uh, which are going to get uh, hired by the government is not even a start. I mean, people are celebrating it so much. What's the big deal? Eight joint secretaries? Let me tell you what's going to happen out here. Out of those eight, six will be from public sector units. One will be from the private sector and one will be from a think tank. Take it. I think we need to get more serious about the revolving door policy. So this is how I see the future of uh, policies. So I'll just take a minute. Uh to end on a slightly lighter note, uh, as I did tell you, I'm, I have to leave, I have to go back to work uh, so before the Q&A session. There's something which came this morning on my Facebook, which is very relevant in the context of the policy execution debates we've been having. How to say no in India? Dekhta hoon, thodi der mein batata hoon, poochna padega, pakka nahi hai abhi, ho jayega, koshish karunga. I think that sums up policy making and policy execution in India, especially in the economic sphere. So that's how you learn how to dispose of files. <laughs> uh, okay, now uh, there, there goes an accountable uh, bureaucrat. Yes, accountable bureaucrat. Now uh, we have we are running out of time, so I'll just open up the house for a brief Q and A session. Uh, raise your hands. We'll collect a few questions. I can't see very clearly. Uh, can you hand the mics over? And if you have it addressed it to a specific person, please let us know. Uh, introduce yourselves. My name is Harsh Gupta. I'm a fund manager. Uh, the question is for the author as well as for anybody who wants to take it. I think Gautam said that, you know, he believes India will be $10 trillion at some point. He didn't give a timeline. I, I, I absolutely agree with him. Uh, I, he doesn't seem too old, so I don't know why he's so pessimistic about it. Um, my, my, my question was about that. So we, we are celebrating two and a half trillion or whatever 2.7 it is, fifth largest, just overtaken France, which has, I think, 20 times the less number of people than we have. And there's absolute extreme poverty seems to have more or less disappeared from India or will in the next three, four years except maybe in the policy circles. Uh, can you keep it brief? Come well, to the question. Where is the ambition in policy making? And it's only, it seems to me psychologically in the last 20 years, only because of China, a large Asian country rising, are we thinking of economic growth aggressively? Otherwise, it seems yeah, okay, to, we, we, we have accepted the that European nations will always remain much richer than us. And to me, that seems extre yeah, extremely you, frustrating. Hi, I'm Rajiv Mantri. Uh, question for the author as well as, uh, if uh, Dr. Kumar or Dr. Ravi want to answer as well, uh, given their time in Delhi. So uh, picking up on the spittoon example, it's shocking to me that someone sitting in a government office here will design a law, write a law with such specificity and granularity. It just tells me that, just imagine how, how much uh, powerful this man must be thinking that he can direct the activities of an individual 
sitting in some corner of the country to put the spittoon in a particular place and so on and so forth. So the question is, what makes uh, people like that or why are policy makers even having this kind of an attitude that they know better uh, and they can direct people in this fashion? Well, the answer to that is codification and standard operating procedures for everything. That is how these things come about, right here. Uh, thank you. I'm Sanju Srivastava. I'm a researcher on foreign policy issues, but good to be here to listen to this debate. Uh, my question is that uh, it is good to have a time limit set for our policy reforms or implementation, but why don't we have a, a consensus or debate to have a consensus on the vision of India, where we, we do we want to take our country forward from uh, five years to ten years' time? So why don't we have that kind of a vision? That's my question. And should we not have should we not have a debate on developing such a vision for our nation? That is my question. Thank you. Hi, my name is Arjun, and I'm a lawyer. I just have uh, one quick question, which is. Uh, a lot of times policy is made in reaction to certain forces. You have a certain new activity, you have certain new business and therefore there are certain pressures, maybe to the incumbent, maybe to the consumers or the people at large. Do you have a framework in mind in which a bureaucrat can say no? In which, I mean, saying that is there, because often when that pressure comes there's a need to regulate or need to create a policy to address that problem. Do you have a framework in mind in which somebody can say no to that point in time? and therefore take a step back and not regulate. Because often stepping in and regulation creates, exacerbates a problem and, and rather than reducing it. And if I can get a quick short question next is to the author, how high do you recommend uh, political reforms, especially reforms to political finance in your larger ecosystem of administrative reforms we need in the country? Okay, let me get back to the panel uh, with this set of questions. You can respond to any of them or whichever you feel need to be commented on. Uh, let me start with you, Shamika. So, um, I get your impatience and, and frankly, I completely empathize with it. In fact, when I was, uh, once when I read the book and also when I heard Gautam speak and Rajiv speak, uh, you know, history is fine. But there, obviously, when you read the book, you also get a sense that we are very hesitant reformers. And it's right. I mean, most of our economic sensibilities are left and more left. Uh, I do think that this prime minister came on the mandate of development and economic reforms. And I think uh, uh, that that mandate largely is still very much uh, uh, there. And uh, I, for one, I'm, I completely empathize with you. So we must make an effort to uh, uh, move in that direction. But let me also caution a little bit in, in, in terms of, you know, the spittoon example that he's, he, he's, he's put out very aptly. A lot of the reforms on the ease of doing business is exactly to get rid of such nonsense. Okay, the minute you try and digitize and, you know, all these 36 processes, you try to come down to single window, etc. exactly to get rid of these kind of, uh, 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 you know, irritants to the system. Uh, your question on, uh, you know, uh, reforms, whether there's a, you know, you have to realize that economic reforms uh, are, is not a pure science. You can never, it, it is trial and error. It is a trial and error in every economy. Uh, of course, having said that, the, you have to learn from your errors. So, so the winding down and, and you know, those costs have to be very quickly internalized. And the only way to do that is to get bright people into the system. Whether you do it through lateral entry or whatever, administrative reform, I do think that we have a, a, a crunch in the administrative capacity in this country to realize these dreams. Rajiv? There's a very fine balancing act for the executive or the policy maker, exactly the executive, between being the vanguard for change and being uh, also not a, you know, not a sort of a omnipresent, you know, um, powerful ruler or rent seeker. So, you know, the, the question that you asked, I think that balance very often gets wonky uh, because of lack of accountability based on performance. So that if you have, please understand that the role of the executive is to make roles. The role of the executive is to make sure, you know, that markets work. Now, you know, and, and, and you can't deny that role. But, and therefore, you know, to say that everybody who made any, you know, rule is therefore doing the wrong thing, no. But there are instances where the executive or the policy, or the political leader, uh, you know, tends to overstep his or her bounds. 
and, and, and interfere into spaces where he shouldn't be, but they, that's, he's, he or she is able to do that because there is no pushback from a society which is demanding accountability. Now that's beginning to change in a very major way. Beginning to change in a very major way and this is why you see much less of that now and you see much less of that as you go forward. Now, you know, so, and, and, and just one uh, example would suffice that we have just seen in the Ministry of Women and Child Development a real-time dashboard which is going to be populated by the 11, li 11 lakh Anganwadis on a daily basis. Now, why I'm saying that is that this Anganwadi worker otherwise could hold sway over the local little population that she, you know, or he, you know, mostly she was you know, handling with. But maybe that will never be possible any longer if you have this, you know, if you have this feedback mechanism going forward because he or she would be accountable for what he or, you know, what her performance would be. So I think the accountability is coming into it and that might be the beginning of uh, administrative reform uh, that we probably will, you know, will be much better than trying to, you know, sort of just overthrow everything that you know as administration. And because I don't think that we, that's, it's that easy. On the vision thing about, the, you know, you said uh, the issue with our um, country and one line answer, absolutely right, we should have. But the point is, which is the starting point? You know, is the starting point, what's, you know, Tripura or is the starting point Maharashtra? So the economic reality in India, you know, is, uh, is, is, is very different. Now you can have a vision document and say that 2047, and a lot of us talk about it, you know, that we will be a $40 trillion economy or a 60 trillion, that's very good. But does that drive action? Does that drive behavior? Does that drive policy? I am not so sure. Because talking pan-India is a very risky game. And this is why Niti is actually now into much more trying to develop state-specific blueprints. Because that's what is probably needed because, because just of what we are. You see, I mean, as I said, from Tripura to Maharashtra, we are a completely different scenario, initial conditions, et cetera, et cetera. Manish. You know, to uh, that question about whether uh, regulation is a reaction uh, to certain new developments which may have taken place, that's uh, absolutely correct. And, uh, and the reason why that happens is that the fundamental milieu of uh, the Indian government is that it's a Maibab Sarkar. So when you start from that impulse, ki we know it all, hum maa baap hai. Therefore, then there is a tendency to control. And I'll give you a classical example. So in 1991, you had cable television invading all our drawing rooms and bedrooms with the first Gulf War. So from 1991 to 1994, there was no regulation of the broadcasting space. And in 1994, the government of India actually came up with the cable television network rules even before the act was put in place. So the act came later and the rules came first. Because there was this growing impatience, I think, somewhere within government. And how's this vast space out of our remit? How are they functioning without our consent? The second issue is that government has made itself completely knowledge proof. They have, you know, absolutely come to a conclusion that we are the repository of all knowledge. And that is why you do not have lateral thinking or any inputs which impact policy making. I keep asking our friends in the think tanks who do excellent work, they tell me which paper of yours or which recommendation of yours has impacted which specific law or policy of the government of India. And the, the, the response is that it's very few and far between. And that is not because think tanks do bad work. 
इट इज जस्ट द वे गवर्नमेंट इज स्ट्रक्चर्ड इट सेल्फ कि भाई हमको किसी की जरूरत नहीं है हम सब जानते हैं एंड द थर्ड मोस्ट क्रिटिकल थिंग विच नीड्स टू बी डन you know uh, just before i went into government the last private members bill which i did was that every law needs to come with a sunset clause that after 20 years the law would lapse till the time parliament does not revisit it and update it because you have laws in the statute book which goes back to the 19th century the indian penal code the indian contract act and i can go on chapter and verse the press regulation act a uh, press registration of books act which goes back to 1861 and this is primarily because of lethargy so till the time you do not set a cut off date that let's say all existing laws will sequentially expire between 2018 and 2030 and all new laws enacted by parliament will come with a sunset clause that until not renewed they would expire after two decades that would be the incentive to keep uh, laws and policy concurrent with changes in society and the last thing is you see we've had a number of administrative commissions and they have written tomes and tomes of paper the last one by mr moili has recommendations which are this high why do you think not a single recommendation has been implemented and the reason is because till the time you do not reengineer administrative processes bottoms up you are not going to have the fundamental change that you're looking at we are a country of 1.24 billion people 900 million people reside in rural india for them the interface with the indian state is either at the level of the patwari or the kanugo at best the tehsildar on the revenue side on the law and order side it is usually with a sub inspector who is a thana in charge and whenever the indian citizen interacts with the indian state the experience is extremely unpleasant so therefore till the time you do not recognize this reality that the indian citizen sees the indian state as an aggressor in his life you know you will not achieve anything by the kind of little tinkering that you do and the final point is you see this 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 tendency to control and i am not trying to make this political but which are the most empowered organizations in this government today the central bureau of investigation the enforcement directorate the income tax these are the most empowered organizations in this government today and so therefore if you are going to have coercive use of power maybe for all the right purposes i am afraid the kind of economic dividend that you are looking for is not going to happen we are not a 2.6 trillion dollar economy we are a 5.2 trillion dollar economy people forget the 2.6 trillion dollar non formal economy that we are and if there is any enlightened policy maker in this country he needs to find a way of mainstreaming the non formal into the formal rather than finishing off the non formal economy that 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 got someone's goat yes <laughs> yeah is that um, Uh, it's been it's, it's about a year that I've joined um, Niti Aayog, and you're going to come up with this document called the Strategy for New India at 75. The work started in about October, and the good news that I wanted to give is that we have had uh, seven, you know, pan Niti consultations with about every different, you know, different stakeholders: farmers, workers, scientists, innovators. We've had 40 different vertical specific consultations. Uh, we've had after i visited 23 states already and every time i've gone i've met with academics and think tanks in those state capitals uh, that i've got that have been there i've had for example people like subhash palekar address all the principal secretaries agricultural secretaries of all the states you know in niti aayog i've had a public me sort of meeting with all the experts on you know on ayushman bharat 
it's, you know, for which they've come. We're now organizing an economist huddle. The first one is already organized, and we're doing this every quarter. And consultations in Niti Aayog uh, are absolutely the norm, especially because we, we know that we cannot, we cannot do without getting knowledge inputs from the outside. And I think of my own conception of Niti Aayog is that of a funnel with the mouth sort of open towards all the people who have ideas and then putting them into the system and following that with the system because everything needs follow-up as well. So, I mean, I just thought I'll give the good news that government, this government at least, and I hope Niti Aayog is considered a part of the government, does not for a minute think of itself as knowledge proof and is looking for ideas all the time. I hope Manish will pardon me that. No, thank you. We also consider Niti Aayog part of us because as a think tank. So you are in good company. <laughs> uh, Sanjay, if I may. Uh, we are running out of time okay. because everyone is now uh, wanting to run away also. Okay? No, you know, the beating <laughs> down on the, you know, the government, if you go to places like Port Blair, people actually love their policemen. You know, in many parts of the country, more than 80 percent. I know, <laughs> but you know, you also have to recognize good where it is due. Many parts of the country, more than 80 percent of states' population goes to public hospitals. Okay, so the you know it's not like all interface with government is necessarily bad. There are lots of good, but obviously a lot more needs to be done. Uh, Gautam, I'll give you the last word. Um, as I take the last word, can I just get a question from Anand? He had been raising his hand out there. You missed it okay. uh, because he will because enlighten the discussion. So as as I uh, what I see is when there is a problem. Uh, and, and the biggest danger to <clears throat> policy making is that we tend to make policy and look at it like a blunt instrument. So if there is some problem, um, we don't try to fix the problem, we need to bring a new law. Let us say lynching. I don't understand how the new law on lynching is going to control lynching any better or more efficiently than the existing laws that already exist. Fake news. You want to now uh, control the mediums rather than the perpetrators. And as, as a result, we, we, we just tend to, I think there is, a, there is a virtue signaling in the way we make policies. And uh, that needs to be replaced with analytical, um, a cost-benefit analysis, the benefits of making a policy need, need to far exceed the costs, and overall, this sense of coercion, the maibap, uh, somebody raised the maibap issue here, that maibapness has to go. This, this has no place in 21st century Indian policy making, that maibap has to go. But I understand that it, it will take a little time, but at least at the central level, the policy making can begin, and I think, uh, Rajiv, perhaps you could look at a new book on how to design policy, where we, we, we don't just make existing policy systems more efficient, but disrupt them uh, to fit into a 21st century India. I, don't, I think we are still steeped in the past. We have a lot of economic history, but we don't seem to learn. And the world's other countries are moving ahead and forward, and we are just trying, okay, so China has done this, let's do that. Europe has gone here, so let's do that. I think we need to look at Indian policy making the Indian way. And just become more accountable. Thank you. I'm sorry I had to do this, but you all didn't see me raising my hand. See, in all the time that I have been reading, I have not come across any penetrative article on defense economics. Thus, the policy of a government, what is the connection between a government policy on defense? What are the defense economics associated with the policies? Where is the gap between the defense economics, the policy and the execution? Or are we, because in the end, it's not about the ordinary people, it is about the soldier on the ground. Is he in any way connected to the policy, the economics, and the execution? I don't get to read anything about defense <laughs> economics. And we are talking about Air India. What about the DPSUs? 
Great. This is thank you. This is a. I mean, uh, that's a comment, not really uh, an answer. Is really warranted yeah. here. Uh, I will just answer? point you in one direction. You must go through the estimates committee report, which has been presented to Parliament on the 25th of July, 2018, and they've done a very thorough job. They've actually looked at all these issues over four years. And that's a document which is worth reading. You may find some answers in that. Manish, why did I guess you would say that? <laughs> now, <laughs> uh, Anand, you want to say something? No yeah. questions. You can make a statement. Right. Don't, don't, don't um, um, take very long time. Just make it short and brief and pithy. Right. Uh, thanks, Gautam. Uh, you know, Gautam talked of the uh, spittoon. Uh, to my mind, the most destructive, disruptive, an unproductive policy since independent India was demonetization. And we have someone sitting on the panel actually saying that was good. Now, I don't know what is more worrying, that people are afraid to call out the Prime Minister or they agree with the Prime Minister. So I think one policy, the 71st, that should be brought about is that the IAS officers and the technocrats and the admin should be fearless in saying that they disagree with a policy. Okay, I think we are going to end here. I want to, all of you to join me in, to do two things. One, congratulate Gotham for this fantastic book, which still sees hands being raised. So please congratulate Gotham for this fantastic effort. And then join me in thanking the panel and the panelists for their excellent interventions this evening. All of them have been illuminating. Many of them can lead to further debates. And many of those debates should happen outside this room and continue for a while longer. So thank you very much. Please join me in applauding this panel. And uh, uh, see you soon at another ORF event. <laughs>